following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The Garden of Eden, Part 2. These are the generations of heaven and of earth when they were created in the day that Jehovah Elohim made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for Jehovah Elohim had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So, when we talk about the Garden of Eden, <coughs> specifically, we read in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, that there were uh, two trees, the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which we always uh, emphasize are the basis for our doctrine. The tree of life is Kabbalah, the tree of knowledge is the sexual force. The being is a study here through Kabbalah. We also state that the tree of life is a being. All the parts of the being manifested in the universe. And of course, as we see, <coughs> the Garden of Eden unites the two trees. It's the only part in the Bible where we find that the tree of life and the tree of uh, knowledge are together. So therefore Eden encloses the mystery of these two trees. So by studying the Garden of Eden is how we unclose the mystery of the two trees. We have talked about them in many lectures. But uh, in this lecture, we had to point at them in relation with ourselves. And for that, we had to explain how these two gardens of Eden manifest. Since you remember, we have stated that there are two gardens of Eden that we explained in the previous lecture. The first garden is what we call the upper garden of Eden that we place in the Sephira Da'at and the second garden we placed it in the Sephira Yesod. 
Of course, here, as you see, the tree of life is uh, showing us ten sephiroth plus that, which is a tree of uh, good and evil. This uh, da'at, or tree of good and evil, is symbolized by the caduceus of Mercury. If you remember, the caduceus of Mercury is uh, formed by three serpents. Actually, the first one, which is in the middle, was taken uh, off from uh, the symbol many years or centuries ago, because in the beginning, the caduceus which is a tube in the middle of the caduceus, was a serpent. And around, entwined around that uh, first serpent was two serpents, which we call Ob and Od, Oida and Pingala, Yin and Yan. On top of the caduceus, of course, you find the sphere, which means the brain. That is a symbol of that, The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of course, the tree of life is the rest of the ten sephirah that you find in this symbol that we always point in order to explain this uh, mystery. According to the book of Genesis, it is stated. Uh, and Jehovah Elohim planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So, in all of the book of Genesis, we find and we read. Jahava Elohim, making this creation. As uh, we know, the name Jahava Elohim corresponds to the Sephira Bina, which is the third Sephira of the triangle on top of the tree of life. Because the name of the second Sephira of the tree of life. Chochma, the sacred name in the world of Atsilut, is Jahava, or simple Jah. And Keter, in the world of Atsilut, receives the name of Eheye. Asher Eheye. That means, according to the book of Genesis, I am what I am. So, these three holy names, because according to Kabbalah, God has uh, ten sacred names in the world of Atziluth. The world of Atziluth is a world of the archetypes, which is represented by this first triangle, Keter Chokhmah Binah, which in Christianity received the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit which in Hinduism received the name of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. They have different names. If we uh, cite here the different pantheons or the different religions, we call it the first uh, Logos, the second Logos, and the third Logos. Logos means word. So this is the triangle of God, called the triangle of the archetypes, Atsiluth. 
where everything is unmanifested, but is manifested in potentiality. These three forces are also called the holy triamatsikamno, the holy trinity, the law of three, the law that creates. These three primary forces of the universe create, but in order to create, they need to gather or to join in a given point. That given point is precisely situated beneath the first triangle and all the symbols of the tree of life and in the sephira that. There is where these three forces unite in order to create. In other words, the book of Genesis says Bereshit, that's the beginning. So Bereshit happens in Da'at. As you see, the word Bereshit begins with B, which is the second letter of any alphabet. I mean, Latin alphabet or Hebrew alphabet. The letter Bet becomes after Aleph. And the letter Aleph is a symbol of wind, the symbol of the spirit, the symbol of air. And that letter Aleph contains the three yods of the first triangle. Yods, I said, because the letter Yod in Hebrew is just a dot. And is placed always in Keter. That is letter Yod, which is the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And is played in Keter because that Yod symbolizes the ten Sephiroth, which emanates from Keter. But because we are talking about the first triangle, which is a triangle of creation, the Holy Triamatsi Kamno, we are saying that this triangle, Keter, Chokhmah, Bina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is symbolized in the letter Aleph. This Aleph is the first letter of the Kabbalistic alphabet and is formed by a letter Vav and two yods. But I said three yods because indeed the letter Vav of the holy name Yod, He, Vav, He is a yod extended down. So when you put just a dot, it's yod. But if you extend that dot vertically and then the letter Vav is formed. So that's why when we talk about the letter Yod or Vav, we are talking about the same letter. So the letter Aleph, as you see, is formed by three uh, graphics. The letter Vav in the middle, one Yod above, and one Yod below. That's Aleph. And this wind, air, and is a symbol of the first triangle of Atzilut. That's why when we say the sacred name of God in the first triangle of Atziluth is Eheye. And that is form with four letters. E, Aleph, Yod, uh, excuse me, is He after that, letter He which is like this, and then the letter Yod, and then another letter He. This is what we call the Holy Tetragrammaton. 
Tetra means four. Tetragrammaton is four-lettered. So we find here one, two, three, four letter in the word that means I am. This is precisely when Moses went up to the Mount of Sinai and when he was before the first Sephira Keter, his own particular individual God, he asked him, what should I say to the people when I go there? Who told me this? Who commanded me to go there to teach them or to take them out of Egypt? And then God said to him, Keter, Hey, hey, yeah. Asher, eh, hey, yeah. I am what I am. That is my name. So that's the first holy name that we find in the Bible, which is a tetragrammaton. Eh, hey, yeah, means I am. But of course, if we read it, we said he is what he is, because we are not Keter. We are the very low. We are Malkut. So he is what he is. But when he says Asher, Asher means who, or what, or that in Hebrew. So that, of course, Asher Eheye implies the Sephira Chokma. But you know Kabbalah. Asher Eheye means the one that will be. In other words, Keter is unknowable. is the one that we don't know. But Asher Eheye in that triangle means Chokma, wisdom, the one that is going to be. And Asher by itself is the Sefirah Bina, what we call the Holy Spirit. Because in order to be what he is going to be, he needs the assistance of Bina, the Holy Spirit, which is a creative force of the universe. So behold here, the first triangle, the names in relation with the first name, <coughs> Eheye, Asher Eheye. Three words which are related with the three primary forces. That's why you find that uh, uh, those three names said to uh, being uh, said to Moses. Because within Keter is Chokmah and Bina. Within Chokmah is Keter and Bina. Within Bina is Keter and Chokmah. Or in other words, within the Father is the Son and the Holy Spirit. Within the Son is the Father and the Holy Spirit. Within the Holy Spirit is the Son and the Father. That's why it's called three primary forces in one. Holy three, unity. And that is the mystery of Asher, or Eheye, Asher, Eheye. Of course, these three primary forces are the ones that create. How do they create? How to create and unite, I said, in that, which is the first garden of Eden. The first Eden that is formed in the universe. Eden itself, of course, means delight. That's the Eden above. Because the Eden below, the second Eden in Yesod, Eden or Edna in Hebrew means pleasure. <coughs> so pleasure in Yesod, delight in that. So, of course, it is written. And from
It says, uh, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Of course, this delight, this Eden, this river that emerges from the first triangle is Chokhmah, which is called the sun, in order to form the first Eden in heaven, which is delight. Chokhmah, as uh, you remember, Receive the second name of Jahava, which in the Bible repeats uh, many translations that said Jehovah. This Jehovah or Jahava is really an androgynous name, meaning that it has the two polarities. Andros means man and Janika means woman. Androgen means male, female is not a male name, as many think. Because the duality of God manifests in all the Sephiroth. So from it, from this duality, emerges a river that will water the garden, which is below. Now, when you read the book of Genesis, it is stated very clear that Jehovah Elohim planted a garden. It doesn't say, it doesn't say there that Jehovah planted a garden or that I am what I am planted a garden, which is the name of Keter. It says Jehovah Elohim, and that is the name of the Holy Spirit in the tree of life. Jehovah Elohim, or Jehovah Elohim, or as the Bible translated, Jehovah God. Or as other, because are afraid to say Jehovah, because they say that is a sacred name that should not be pronounced. So they said, the Lord God. So in many Bibles, you find the, the Lord God. Well, actually, Lord in Hebrew means Adonai, Adon, Adonai. But here, very clear, we read that Jehovah Elohim, or Jehovah Elohim, planted a garden. Many Kabbalists state that uh, the father is Chokhmah and that the mother is Bina. But this is a mistake, or a, we will say it, a wrong interpretation. Because delight or Eden in Hebrew means, of course, the delight of the union. Of the two polarities. That's why in the Sohar they state that this delight, or that's Eden, is a union of Ava and Ima, or Aima, father and mother. Do you hear that commandment that says uh, uh, honor father and mother? But this father and mother that the commandment states is not, of course, the physical father and mother that we have here in the physical plane. It relates. To these two forces that we call Jehovah or Jehovah. Jah is a representation of the masculine force, and Hava is translated as Eve. You say, how do you say it, uh, uh, Eve in Hebrew? It's Hava. So it's the end of the name, Jehovah or Jehovah. So it's an androgynous name. So that Jehovah or Jehovah is of course the holy name of God in Chokmah. But sometimes they symbolize it just simple as yes. Yod He which reads Ya or Ja. And of course, implies in the world of Atsiluth the activity of the feminine and the masculine. Yah. Because Yod symbolizes the phallus. And He, the second letter, symbolizes the uterus. 
So uniting the phallus with the uterus in Kabbalah, you find the word Jah. But if you just name Jahava, and then you take the word Jah as masculine, and Hava, Eve, as feminine. Either way, you, always, you said just Jah or Jahava, always implies the two polarities. So these two polarities is what we were saying, Asher Eheye, I will be. I will be. So this Chokhma is the one that will be. But many Kabbalists state and think that it's a masculine force that will be. No. It's an androgynous force that will be. Because the masculine force cannot be without the feminine. And the feminine force cannot be without the masculine. It's impossible. And we can prove that physically. Try a man to have a, a, a son without a woman is impossible. Or well, a woman have a son without a man is impossible. Or an oven without a sperm or a sperm without an oven. Because you know that in this day and age even they make experiments. <laughs> right? But they need always the two polarities. Oven and sperm. Or so sperm will tell. So behold here that this Jahava Elo, Jahava, I mean these two polarities had to be united in that which is the first Eden. It only to create. Of course, in order to do that, they need both polarities need. The activity of the sexual force. Because the two polarities, universal polarities, in order to be, they need a sexual force in order to manifest. And that sexual force is called Bina, the Holy Spirit. In other words, this Jahava, when expressing itself through the sexual force, becomes Jahava Elohim. And this is precisely the point here, because the first time that you hear the word Elohim in the Bible, according to Kabbalah, is in the Sefirah Bina. It has the word Elohim, which means gods and goddesses. Not as the translator translates the word as God. But God is masculine. Goddess is feminine. But this word Elohim implies the duality within the plurality. Elohim means gods and goddesses. So this force of the Holy Spirit is the one that manifests in that. And as a very explicit in the book of Genesis, it says, And Jahava Elohim planted a garden in Eden. Because through Bina is how the three primary forces are going to create. <coughs> but the one that will be is Chokhmah, wisdom. And here's the mistake in which many Kabbalists uh, fall. Because the one that will be is Chokhmah, they think, oh, and then Chokhmah is the father and Bina is the mother. But they don't understand that Chokmah is that river that emanates, that will water the garden. How do we explain this? Well, again, we have to go into the Hebrew letters. Because if we don't know the Hebrew letters, we fall into many mistakes. That's why we insist in this doctrine to study the Hebrew letters, which are only 22 simple but it goes deeper and deeper because there are three letters here that symbolize or they are related with the elements we name the first which says Aleph which means the wind the air which is the one that forms a hey yeah because it's at the beginning of that mantra or that tetragrammaton the second letter here that we want to mention now 
is the letter Shin, which means fire. The letter Shin is made like a, a trident. Simple, you know, the, the, the very end uh, of the head of a trident, the letter Shin, which again, you see, is formed by three, one, two, three. That's why this Shin, fire, also symbolizes the three primary forces. But since we are naming now the river that comes from Eden in order to garden, I mean, in order to water the garden, we have to name Chokhmah, which is precisely that river. And in many lectures, we explain that our physicality is formed by three brains. We have the intellectual brain, we have the emotional brain, and we have the motor instinctual sexual brain. This is why we are a three-brained creatures. So our left, of course, is above, is the air. Even if we point the lungs, of course, the air enters through the nostrils and goes into the lungs. That's the A, the letter A. In the heart, as you know, we have the blood or the organ that takes care of the blood. That blood is formed in this area where we eat with the spleen, the energies that we take from the atmosphere while we sleep. The spleen takes a lot of solar light and transforms it into red cells. And of course, the liver also creates what we call the venom blood, the poison blood, which is not purified. That blood goes into the heart. The heart takes the air that we breathe and purifies with the oxygen that unpurified blood. When the lungs purify it, it turns into the heart and is a purified blood. <coughs> well, this blood in Hebrew is uh, dam, dalet mem, pronounced dam. That's blood. But if you put the A, the oxygen that we are spraying here of what we breathe of the air into the blood, and then we form, we form the word Adam. So Adam is the outcome, of course, of the purified blood with the oxygen. That's the Adam. We, we call it impotentiality. That's the Adam that is written in the book of Genesis in Jahavai Elohim still didn't make the man to till the ground. That man is that he said didn't make Adam yet. That Adam of course in this case symbolizes the blood. You see the blood and that is symbolized with the letter Shin. This letter Shin in Kabbalah, when we place it in the heart, relates to the second triangle. Chesed, Gebura, Tifereth. Spirit, divine soul, and human soul. That's the man that the book of uh, Genesis relates, made into the image of God. In the book of Genesis, Chesed is Abraham. Geburah is Yitzhak. And Tifereth is Jacob. These three patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob, represent that triangle of the, of the letter Shin. So the letter Shin, of course, is created or emerges from the mixture of fire with air. You got that? Because the blood is a vehicle of the fire. So fire with air is Adam. 
So then, this shin, which is here, represents Chokhmah. Because this Chokhmah, the second sephira of the Holy Trinity, which is called the sun, rules the heart. That's why in Christianity you find that the sun, the Christ, is always pointing the heart with a lot of fire. Hmm? That sun with a lot of fire is precisely the blood purified by the oxygen. And that's why it is said that the Father and the Son are one in the heart. So the blood becomes one with the air, with the oxygen, when the lungs purify the blood and returns and give life. That's why Christ incarnated in the body of Jesus of Nazareth says, I am the life. I am the life. He says, hey, yeah. Hi. I am life. Of course, the life of our body is in the heart. So, of course, this river that descends, as you see, from above is Chokhmah, the sun, which is one with the Father into the heart. But thus is through Eden, which is the Sephirah Da'at, which is delight. That's why the river that comes out in order to water the Garden of Eden, it is stated in the Zohar, is Chokhmah, is the sun. Is that second aspect of the Holy Trinity. Because that sun is, I will be. In other words, the universe exists because of Chokhmah. That's why the word in Genesis, Bereshit, means in wisdom or through wisdom. Bet, which is the second letter, relates to Chokhmah, the second sephira. Bereshit, in wisdom. That is translated in the beginning. But that's beginning is through Chokhmah. But of course, as you listening now, this blood goes into the whole body and finally crystallizes in the testicles or in the ovaries <coughs> as zoosperm and ovum. The ovum and the zoosperms are the outcome of the purified blood, which of course relates to all the organs, glands that we have in the organism. But that's the final distillation of the solar force that enters into the body. So yeah, you find that this river, which is in this case in our body, the blood, enters into the lower Eden, which is our sexual force. Because when we point the lower Eden in alchemy, it's just so, the sexual force. But this sexual force comes from delight, Eden above, and becomes pleasure, Eden below. Remember that delight is above and pleasure is below. Delight is father, mother. Pleasure below is Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. The two polarities always represented in the two testicles, in the two ovaries, or directly men and women. The two polarities always is Adam and Eve. But above, this Adam and Eve are Yahweh. Ava and Ima, father and mother. So this is how we have to visualize and to comprehend that Chokma, as a river, enters into that, and through Ava and Aima, make the creation. Who is this Ava and Aima, father and mother? Is the duality of the Holy Spirit, 
that emerges from the river, which is the sun, Chokhmah. This is what we have to understand and comprehend. The father says, I am the one that I am. The son says, I will be. And in order to be, expresses to be now, which is a share. Is the one that will be. So then the river goes down from Chokhmah, which it will be, through the duality of the Holy Spirit. Now we have to enter into the third letter in order for you to grasp. Because in Kabbalah there is a third letter that symbolizes water, which is the letter Mem. As you remember, Aleph is air. Sheen, as we said, that is in the heart, is fire. And Mem is water. This is why this letter Mem, with that uh, letter we form the word Mayim, which in Kabbalah in Hebrew means water. But if you put the letter Shin in the beginning of uh, this word, letter Shin, you for the word Shamayim. This word Shamayim is made with Mayim and Shin. The fiery water, fiery water, which is translated in the Bible as heaven. You know, when it says in the beginning God created the heaven, Shamayim says in Hebrew. But this means fiery water above. And that fiery water, as you see, is the letter Shin, above. Because it's Chokhmah in the heart, the blood, making heaven. That's why when we point heaven, from heart above. So then, of course, the letter Shin, as you see, has the three primary forces that are represented in the second triangle, which is the Adam, as we said. And the letter Aleph also has the three primary forces, which is the all manifested, the air, the wind, God above. <coughs> but here, we don't have any letter with three symbols. Because the letter Mem is symbolized sometimes in two ways. The closed Mem and the other open Mem. There are two Mems. There are no three, only two. Behold here the duality. I mean, the Sephira, Bina, which is also related always related with water, expresses himself or itself as dual in the letter Mem. The letter Mem, close Mem, is of course the activity of Bina, the Holy Spirit, in potentiality. But when it opens, means that it's flowing, it's going out to create. So of course, the letter Mem above and the letter Mem below, we will say it, is father and mother. Because these two waters are related, of course, with a sexual force. When we always talk about the water, we always talk about the two forces. That's why the book of Genesis says, and a river went out to water. To water means the Holy Spirit. That this Chokhmah, which is fire, Shin, is going to water the garden to Maim, Mem, which is the Holy Spirit, forming Shamayim, which is always related with that. So many Kabbalists says Chokhmah is the father and Bina is the, is the mother. Wrong. Because the duality of father and mother are in Chokhmah and expressing themselves as creation in Bina, which is 
Jahová Elohim. And that's why the book of Genesis states very clear. And Jehovah Elohim planted a garden. But within him, within Jehovah Elohim is Chokmah and Keter. He's the Father and the Son within the Holy Spirit. As we, for instance, we want to multiply, we want to have a son, a child, we need our sexual force. And when we go to the sexual act, we connect sexually through the genitalia. Of course, we understand that the soul sperm and the ovum, female and male, are formed with the blood, with what we think, what we eat. When we are in the sexual act, we are not only with the sexual organs there. Our heart is there, our head is there. So in other words, when the Holy Spirit is performing this creation, the Son is there and the Father is there. As we, when we are making a sexual act, the heart is there and the head is there. Because the three parts of us here below symbolize the three primary forces that we have. The Father in the head, the Son in the heart, and the Holy Spirit in the sex. Seen from that point of view, Aleph, Shin, and Mem, the three primary forces of the three letters, called mother letters, that symbolize air, fire, and water. Air in the head, fire in the heart, and water in the sex. So, this is how the three primary forces, called three Amatsi Kamno, the holy three, creates. You see? But obviously we are divided. Where are we divided? In the sex. If we see a woman and a man together, naked, the only difference we will see the sexual organs. The rest is the same. There is the only difference. The duality of mem. So this is why we Gnostically always insist that the first garden of Eden is made by Ava and Aima, delight, father and mother. But this is the duality of Bina, Jehovah Elohim, as the Bible says very clear. And that's why, by understanding this, is how we understand ourselves too. <coughs> because you know that. This river that is coming from above, this delight of this garden of Eden above, is the source of life of the garden below. Now here, physically speaking, we said that this physical body is a garden. It's really a garden made by the Holy Spirit. When we said, and Jehovah Elohim planted a garden, we are saying, and Jah, the man, and Hava, Eve, the woman, make the sexual act, or made the sexual act, and planted a garden, a physical body, in the womb of the woman. And that physical body, develops. If you study the development of the fetus in the womb of the woman, you see how first forms the brain, spinal column, which is called the central nervous system, the cerebrum spinal nervous system, which is the vehicle of the father. And from that vehicle of the father, which is the brain and the medulla, is formed little by little the other branches. The second branch is called the grand sympathetic nervous system, which is connected to the spine, to the medulla. And the other branch is the parasympathetic nervous system. These three main nervous systems, central nervous system, 
grand sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. The three of them are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three primary forces in the body that are creating, of course, as we explain, the garden in the womb of the woman. That garden is the physical body. The physical body is not just three-dimensional, as many people think. Indeed, this physical body is tetradimensional. That's four dimensions. The fourth dimension of the physical body is called vital body. In other uh, places, they call it ethereal body. If you are very psychic and concentrate your mind, your eyes around the physical body, you see the aura, the life of this physical body, which is the vital body, which is being photographed in this day and age by the scientists, by the famous uh, Killian camera. It's nothing new, of course, but you need a camera in order to see it. If you develop clairvoyance, you can see it without a camera and study it. This is the superior part of the physical body, which together with the physical body in the womb of the woman are being developed and becoming the physical body, which is called the lower Eden, which is given to the soul. Because we are the soul within this physical body. Unfortunately, we were placed in the Garden of Eden, which is pleasure. As babies, we were walking in the Garden of Eden and enjoying all the fruits of the Tree of Life. The fruits of the Tree of Life as are related to the three nervous systems which connect to the senses and to the internal senses. So any child, when he's growing up, enjoys the fruits of the spinal medulla, the spinal column, the tree of life, and the branches, which are these nervous systems. His clairvoyant, clairaudient, telepathy, intuitive, it uses all the powers of the senses of the soul, plus the five senses. That's why it is stated that the fruits of the tree of life are 12. The five senses and the seven churches or seven chakras related with the spinal column. With any child enjoys and sees what we don't see. Because unfortunately, we were kicked out of that garden. In the beginning, we were in the garden as souls. But little by little, because our ego or because sexual degeneration, we will kick out just to the five senses, to the exterior wall of Malkut. And now we have to learn to return into that uh, psychological universe that people call unconsciousness subconsciousness, infra-consciousness, the world of dreams. We are unconscious now. But in the beginning, we were not. We were conscious. We lost that because our sexual behavior, because we abuse, abuse of the tree of life. What is this tree of, I mean, the tree of knowledge of good and evil? What is this tree of knowledge of good and evil? It's in the middle. As you see, it's written there that Jehovah Elohim planted the, uh, the tree of life in the middle. If you see, the, the spinal medulla is in the middle of your physical body. From that middle, the spinal column goes the two branches, which manifest the other two forces of the Holy Trinity, which are connected to the senses, to the organs, and all that that we have in the physical body and to the psychic powers. So these 12 fruits we were enjoying in the beginning. But then we ate and we inherit, unfortunately, the original sin 
the original sin, which is the sin of abusing the sexual force, which is also the other tree, which is in the middle. Now, if you see the sexual organs, it's also in the middle, vertically and horizontally, the sexual organs here, which is symbolized, as I said, by the caduceus of Mercury. Because this caduceus of Mercury with the two serpents around the caduceus nourished the tree of life. The tree of life and the tree of good and evil, knowledge, share their roots in Yesod. And as you see, are in the middle of your body. These two nervous systems, or these nervous systems, are connected to the vital body, to the ethereal body, to the forces which are in the fourth dimension. The superior part of the physical body, which we said is the ethereal body, connects us to the fourth dimension, where we find the terrestrial paradise that the Bible talks about. That terrestrial paradise is not in the physical plane, it's in the fourth dimension. And we are connected to this terrestrial paradise, to the vital body. But unfortunately, we squeeze, you see, the vitality of the vital body through our actions in the physical plane. The vital body takes, as we said, the solar light from the atmosphere through the spleen. And we feed our vitality through what we eat, even with the atmosphere. But we squander that vitality to the seven capital sins that we have. To, through anger, through gluttony, to laziness, especially to, through lust which is precisely uh, the activity of the sexual glands, which are connected. <coughs> because this sephira yeshod, which is the terrestrial paradise, the terrestrial Eden, is connected to our vital body. And we don't enter there because we are squandering the force of the vital body through the three brains, through what we think, through what we feel, and through the sexual activity. That's why we state always, the door into Eden is the sexual energy. You want to return into Eden, into the delights which are coming from above, and then you have to take care of your sexual force to begin. Because also you have to take care of your emotional energy and your mental energy. Remember that the three brains, the three forces, the three primary forces work through your body. Unfortunately, since we were uh, using the forces of the vital body, or the forces of Eden in the wrong way, we were kicked out of Eden. But it's not as people think. Now, some God came there and kicked us out and said, because you are behaving bad. No, we did it by our, with our own actions. Because in order to enjoy the fruits of the tree of life, you don't have to eat from the fruits of the tree of good and evil, which are your sexual force, to begin. We develop the seven capital sins through which we squander the vital force of of Eden. In other words, to synthesize, Eden is called pleasure. The pleasure of the soul, the ecstasy, the rapture of the soul within Jehovah Elohim, within the two waters, by honoring father and mother. But uh, we, didn't e we didn't even know that we have father and mother internally. Because that is in, in our energy. And that father and mother expresses in Yesod, in the sexual force. In the fourth dimension, the vitality. 
That's why when you really read the book of Genesis, you don't understand what you're reading because you need vitality, you need the force of the Holy Spirit in order to understand that. In order to penetrate in the mysteries of Eden. But those mysteries are related with the sexual force, above and below. Because God created the universe above with the sexual force, through Jehovah Elohim. And below, we were created, we were created through the sexual force as, as well. Because our father and mother uh, created us in the sexual act, in your soul, with the two waters. Unfortunately, they created us by squeezing themselves by extracting the vitality of their own Eden in the sexual act. In other words, by performing the orgasm, the spasm of the animals. This is how we extract the force. This is what the Bible calls fornication. That's the original sin of Adam and Eve. Performing the sexual act with orgasm. This is very clear. We have to talk very clear now because we are in the times of the end. And the people need this. Because as you see, nature is destroying everything. It needs a new humanity. But this humanity needs to know how to become part of that new humanity. By behaving sexually different. Because unfortunately, in this day and age, about sex, there's a lot of literature there through which you can degenerate yourself easily, more than we are already. So then, our father and mother, physically speaking, created us through fornication. They reached the orgasm or the spasm. <coughs> and uh, uh, in despite of that, the Holy Spirit came and with pain created that garden of Eden in order to give that garden to another soul to see if this new soul will respect the garden of Eden. But as long as the physical body goes out of the womb, that soul is enjoying the garden of Eden, the psychics, the fruits of the tree of life. But as soon as he reaches puberty, teenage, to start masturbating himself or herself, squandering the sexual energy there, and they lose little by little that pleasure, that delight, that rapture. And people, of course, read about it, or they are looking for the Garden of Eden, and they don't know that they have them, and they carry them, or they carry it, I mean. The two gardens, itself, indeed. In the superior part themselves, this is the vital body. Every night we charge our garden of Eden, the vital body, with new energies. And when we awake and start doing our work, we squander the energy of Eden again and we never return. That's why in the Sohar, the book of Kabbalah, it is stated that this garden of Eden has also another door, exit. Not a door of entrance, but an exit door. And that exit door uh, is the door of hell. A door that is always open. And uh, for that, let me read something that Master Jesus says in the Bible. In the book of Matthew, verse 7, verse 15, 20. He said this to those people that knew about this, that we are talking here. Enter ye in to Eden. This is what I'm adding to parentheses. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Gehenna, or Jehenna, 
This is what the, the Bible said, or the book of, of Sohar, Kabbalah. Jehenom, or Jehenna, is a synonym of, of hell. And this is what we said, Klipoth. The inferior dimensions. So in Yasod, which is Eden, you have the entrance, that gate, which is very straight and narrow, which is the, the gate of chastity. But the broad gate that goes out into hell is precisely fornication. It's easy to find and easy to follow. Because everybody fornicates. Everybody is reaching the orgasm, the spasm. To stop that and to learn, to teach the physical body how to transmute. It's precisely the science of that, the science of the tree of knowledge. First, the student teaches himself or herself how to transmute individually. How to take advantage of his sexual or her sexual energy. <coughs> and later on, as married couple, they learn how to perform the sexual act without the orgasm. That is called Tantra, white Tantra. Difficult. It's not easy. But it's not impossible. Because while you learn, you can do it. So enter ye into Eden at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to he Jehenon, destruction. And many there be which go in there it and there at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto the tree of life, and few there be that find it. Or it says, or straight leadeth unto, unto life. But life is the tree of life. And this is precisely. You see, narrow, the spinal marrow, spinal medulla, is the way into the tree of life. But for that, you had to know how to transmute your sexual force in Eden. And that pleasure, which is a sexual act. And few there be that find it. Beware of the false prophets from Klipoth, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but in worldly they are ravening wolves. Ravening wolves. These are precisely those people that you find that defend the orgasm, the spasm, with shield and sword. And they say that this is not necessary. But we that are practicing it and that transmute our sexual force, we give faith of it. That's the door in order to enter. But people that want to enter, they think that by other practices, because exist Black Tantra and Great Tantra, which teaches completely different. What we teach here is White Tantra, written in the book of the Master Samael on the Or, the perfect matrimony. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? When you read this, it says, well, grapes of thorns, figs of thistles. What is this? What he, he didn't say uh, bananas or didn't say, for instance, another fruit, maybe dates. What specifically grapes and, and figs? Because the grape is the vine, is the, is the, is the, comes, is the outcome of the two polarities, the two forces. That's the grape. And that's why the grape is the symbol of the Eucharist. They make the wine or the grape juice in order to celebrate the Eucharist, which is the blood of the Lord, the symbol there of transmutation. And figs. The fig is a tree that symbolizes the feminine sexual forces. The feminine sexual forces, of course, are symbolized in the woman, but also in the man and the woman in the left serpent called Ida, or the lunar forces where the physical body gather, because we have that Eve 
or that ida, that orb of Kabbalah, connected to one of our testicles. And that is the serpent of the Caduceus of Mercury that ate the forbidden fruit or that offered the forbidden fruit to the sexual organs. Because Eve is the sexual organs and Adam is the brain. To Eve, not to Adam, were offered the forbidden fruit, which is the sexual organs. And of course, the consequences of fornication of Eve infected Adam, the brain, which is the grand central nervous system, the central nervous system connected to the medulla and to the other centers which are connected to the tree of life. That's why we don't eat any more of the tree of life or those senses, because we are boost through Eve to the sexual organ, the sexual energy. So that's why this tree of good and evil, that is a sexual energy connected to the two worlds. Good is up here. And Ra, in Hebrew, evil, is of course the other force, which goes into hell. So that's why it is stated that Eve connects us to hell. And that's all the symbol is a feminine force. This is how we open the doors when we ab abuse of the sexual energy in Eden, in Yesod. We open the doors of Jehenom or Jehenna, hell, and we go into Klippoth. And then here, we appear in the physical world, being vehicles, physical vehicles of hell. This is this society now. Because of fornication, they open the doors of hell and bring up all this hell that we have in the physical world. So each one of us <coughs> brings his, her own hell through the activities of the sexual act. As more degeneration, sexual degeneration exists, more pollution comes from Klippoth, from hell, into the physical world. Sicknesses, whether physical, psychological, psychosomatic, etc. This hell in which we live is because of our sexual behavior. Now, remember, Every time that you are going to perform the sexual act, every time <coughs> that you are going to connect your, yourself sexually, or you're going to manipulate the sexual energy in such a way, a masturbation, you are squandering the energy of Eden. Through your actions. In other words, you, we are already out of Eden and we still repeat the same thing in order to be out of that Eden. Of course, delight in Hebrew is oneg, that's how you say delight, oneg, which formed with three letters. The first letter is ayin which is the letter that you write Eden. The second letter is Nun, which is Nahar, river in Hebrew. And the other letter is Gimel, which is garden. You said uh, in Hebrew. So when you say uh, Oneg, in Hebrew, you are naming the three letters. 
or say, in other words, in a river went out of Eden in order to water the garden. That's delight. In Hebrew, delight, Kabbalistically, discloses in this way. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. That is delight. And a river from the heart went out into the garden, the sexual force, to water the physical body with life. So this river that we always talk about, that went out of Eden, is the sun, Christ, the solar light. Many times we repeat, the sun, Christ, is not a person. It is the solar light, the solar force, which is life. That's why this Christ, in the body of Jesus, said, I am the light of the world. Because the solar light is the light of the world. That's the vehicle of life. That's cosmic Christ. That should and must be humanized in each one of us. He enters. There is not a single physical body in this earth where the Lord doesn't enter in. Christ enters, whether you are Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, who cares about your religion? Christ always enters into you through your blood and gives life to your body. That's the river that comes out of Eden, the light from above, enters into your body and waters the garden, your physical body, with life. But what, you, what do you do with that life that the Lord gives you as a gift, free, gratis? You come and squander it through many stupidities. Because in this day and age, you see, there are many ways in which we squander that energy through the head, through the heart, into the sexual act, of course. That's the sadness. That's the, the, the mystery here. We want to return into that delight or egg from above and only to share with God the delight, the pleasure, the rapture. We have to change our sexual behavior. And that's why it is stated, many false prophets will come and teach you the contrary. So you have to gather figs and grapes. In other words, these figs and grapes are the symbol of the sexual force that you have to gather little by little. For the fruits, you will know them. Because these senses awake and give you the power of tongues which means the power of interpreting the word of God. Power of tongues is not uh, epileptic attacks, as many people think. But they fall on the ground and they start talking nonsense. And it says the Holy Spirit is talking through them. That's nonsense. That's not power of tongues. That's something uh, demoniacal, possessed. Power of tongue is to know how to understand what is written in the word of God. Not only in the Bible, in any book. So, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not for good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Of course, we are only concerned with two types of fruits. The tree of life and the tree of good and evil, tree of knowledge. These are the only two fruits that we want to develop inside in our own garden. But we abandoned our own garden already. Now we have to return and to read what the Bible says. It says that still there was not a man to till the ground. 
and we are here. We are that soul that could become a man. But we now, we now have to learn how to till the ground of our own particular garden, which is our physical body. It's not by believing in anything. You might believe in this interpretation, but if you don't do it, then the garden is still just abandoned. Each one of us is a walking garden. We carry it, but we abandoned our vineyard, our own garden. Now we have to learn and to obey Jehovah Elohim, which is the Holy Spirit, in order to till the ground and to put in activity all of those elements which are in potentiality in our garden. Because still there is no trees. Even though the man himself is a yielding tree and the woman herself is a fruit tree. A man is a yielding tree because gives fruit to the woman and the woman flourishes with fruits. That is the fruit tree, the woman, the female. But when you talk about the tree, the yielding tree is a man. And the fruit tree is a woman. So remember that Eve took from the fruit tree and opened the doors of hell. So man himself, we say him, but in reality man itself is, is androgynous. It's a trio of body, soul, and spirit. The spirit, of course, is God within. That is connected to that Jehovah Elohim to father and mother up there. That is spirit that the Bible called the Ruach Elohim is our own particular spirit within, descends from above into our physical body, sent by the Holy Spirit, by Jehovah Elohim. And in order to prepare the physical body for his son, which is the soul, or for his child, which is his soul. We are the soul. So as souls, we have the duty of till the ground of this physical body, of manipulate the forces of this physical body for our spirit, for our God. Because we need to obey the spirit in order to take care of the body. As in ancient times, symbolically, of course, Alchemically speaking, the Holy Spirit put Adam in the Garden of Eden to take care of it. The same thing is happening in actuality, in the present time. Our own particular spirit is placing the soul, we are the soul, into the Garden of Eden to take care of it. But we don't take care of this. Because remember that the superior part of the physical body is what is related with Eden, the vital body, the ethereal body. And just by taking care of it is how we obey the law. The first commandment given to the soul, which is a symbol of Tifereth, the sixth Sephira, in the Garden of Eden, was, you shall not eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge which is a sexual force because the day that you eat from it you will die that's the first commandment but because it's related to the sephira tifereth which is the soul given to the soul which is the number six counting from above one two three four five six manifested sephira relate to the sixth commandment you shall not fornicate. And that's why you read in the Bible, 
lot of passages when they teach you that you shall not fornicate, that you should avoid fornication, in order to return as a soul into the Garden of Eden. And that's why in Kabbalah, we place the men in Yesod, in the waters. And that's why Jesus was baptized in the river of Yesod, in the waters. And from the waters, he emerged. And the Holy Spirit, from that, came into him. And he felt delighted. Because he was coming from pleasure. Chastity. We can keep talking about this. Because really this Garden of Eden encloses the whole Bible. Since the Garden of Eden encloses the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. Together. And that is our doctrine. The Gnostic doctrine is the doctrine of the Garden of Eden. Which is related with Yasod and Da'at. Related with father and mother. Related with all the commandments. Do you have questions? I can say more, but I think is is enough shots here. Right? So, <coughs> yeah. What's the difference in the translation between the two tetragrammatons, Yote Bate and A A E A? Well, be translated as I am who Yeah. What is the question? Is what is the difference between the tetragrammatons, so the different four-lettered uh, names that we find in different uh, esoteric uh, literature? Eheye, of course, is the tetragrammaton, means I am. We, we, always, uh, we always translate it as he is, because we refer to the father, Keter, the father of all the lights, which is above in the world of Atsilus. The other word is, of course, Yod, He, Bab, He, which is the manifested name of God that is translated as Jehovah. And we said it's Jahava or Job Hava. And uh, there is other tetragrammaton, which is Agla. It's a powerful word. Which means Ata Gibor Leolam Adonai. You are almighty forever, O God. O Lord, in other words. You are mighty forever, O Lord. This is Agla. This is another mantra that you pronounce uh, in many conjurations. And of course, there is another mantra given uh, by Master Jesus. It's a mantra in Ingri, which is a Latin mantra, for letter too. Ignis natura renovator integra. The fire renews nature constantly. That is a mantra as well, with which we manipulate the fire, Ingri. That's why it is placed on the top of the cross. Because Ingri is that mantra of the fire that manipulates the masculine forces, the vertical beam, and the feminine forces, the horizontal beam, that make the cross on which the man is crucified. Because we have to be crucified there in order to do the work. That's why you see it's not an easy work, but that's a symbol of the crucifixion Ingri which means also Jesus nascente renovato integra it has many meanings there are many tetragrammatons and all of them are very powerful you pronounce them in the right way in the moment when you need it The question is, 
Does an any Mahama Mantara the humanity falls? Of course, yeah. The falling is something that happens every single cosmic day. But there are different levels in falling. This humanity of the planet Earth fell, but too low. Commonly, in other planets, humanity falls because they need to know in order to know good and evil, in order to become Elohim. But they fall, we will say, and they build uh, ego, defects, vices, errors, as much as a 10%. The problem here in this planet is that humanity fell and built ego, 97%. This is overwhelmingly incredible. 97%. That's why it is very difficult, but not impossible. That's why the great master of Veramento, Aparamarta Satya, an inhabitant from the Absolute, came to this planet in order to assist us, to help us. But it's not by believing in him, Master Jesus of Nazareth, that you are going to be saved now. It's by performing what we are explaining here. Because the masters, assist you internally in Eden to beginning in Eden which is the fourth dimension and then in the fifth, in the sixth, in the seventh there the master assists you because you need to start doing your work in Eden which is the fourth dimension and the only organs that are connected to Eden in this physical plane are the sexual organs and the spleen so by performing chastity in the sexual act is how the master start helping you in your vital body and then in your astral body and then in your mental body and through the initiations of mere mysteries. Do you have another question? Is there a relationship between the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane? Is there a relation of the Garden of Eden and the, uh, and the Garden of Gethsemane? Or the, uh, is this the Mount of Olives, right? where Jesus is praying. This is Tifereth. Well, we will say that the soul, Tifereth, Master Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, is a preparation in order to go into Yesod, Eden, and to be united with the light. And you see, for instance, this is a beautiful question, because Jesus is praying on the rock, Jesus represents Tifereth, the human soul. The rock is Yasod. This is a symbol of also of this Sephira, the rock. The rock upon which you have to build your church, your temple. So Jesus is sitting there and praying on the rock. And then from the light, heaven above, Shamajim, comes an angel. It's his own angel his own being and he shows him the cross meaning to perform the sexual act that's the cross and a cup also the gospel that cup because Jesus is masculine meaning you have to have a wife you have to receive a woman down there in order to be crucified so that's the, it's a, a great message there, meaning that the soul is saying, well, you want to be united with me in the light, heaven above, you have to go down to Yesod and have a cup, the Holy Grail. That in this day and age, many talk, this is Mary Magdalene. Yeah, it's a woman. And it was Mary Magdalene. That's the Holy Cup, the Holy Grail. You have to go there and receive her, but not fornicate because it's the sixth in the Gethsemane in Tifereth you shall not fornicate and of course when he decides he says well father make thy will be done and not mine because if you said do you want it I said no because I know what it is but the father says no this is my will I said thy will be done this is what is the prayer in the Gethsemane and when he decides to go down, 
who is coming now to betray him? Of course, Judas. Judas Iscariot, which is that apostle related with the sexual glance. Judas Iscariot is related with fornication and with adultery. Everybody carries Judas Iscariot in this area of the abdomen. He comes and says, okay, now you want to suffer the passion. You see, even they say the word, the passion of the cross. Because I'm Judas Iscariot in this area. I'm related to lust, to anger, to adultery, to all the defects that you have within. And now you have to suffer because if I don't die, you won't resurrect. It does a, a great, I mean, I mean, a great message there. Jesus is betrayed, and of course, the great scandal is because uh, he decided to enter into the ninth sphere, into the work with Mary Magdalene, which is the cross. That's the path of the cross. Mary Magdalene and Jesus. Without Mary Magdalene, there is no path of the cross. Jesus will be only uh, carrying just a, a vertical beam on his shoulders. Now it has to be an horizontal too, which is the woman. And he is doing it, little by little, and rising in the spinal column until he reaches Golgotha, the place of the skull. As this is written in the gospel. And then to be crucified. So he's related, of course. He's related with the two of them, with delight eating above and pleasure eating below. That's the mysteries of the Gospels that were written as well and were explained there, but the Pharisees, hypocrites, took them out because they didn't like it. They wanted a castrated Jesus. But with the Gnostics, we know that Jesus had a wife. He was not castrated. He was a true man. Do you have another question? Archetypes means that the elements that are in an absolute, of course, in the absolute is unmanifested. But in absolute are there, but are not in, in activity, in potentiality. From that point of view, we will say that even in the physical body, they are not in activity, but in potentiality. That is where is the archetypes, the world of absolute, where you find all the forces of God, but they are not active. In order to become active, they need to be in that. So therefore, we will say, it, oh, manifested. They are there, manifested, but they are not developed. So they are unmanifested in that sense. Comprende? Do you have another question? Well, let me tell you, this uh, uh, beautiful lecture of Eden could be f even three, Eden four, five, but I think this is enough because I will be more cryptic. <laughs> it will be more difficult, right? Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,